introduce you uh, Mike Griffin, a former NASA administrator, and he's here to speak to you. Please give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, my thanks to Robert for inviting me to do this keynote. I think the last time I spoke to the Morris Society, I was um, uh, a, a sitting NASA administrator, and uh, everyone then wanted to find out, well, what do you really think? And I always told people what I really thought, and you won't see any difference today, uh, now that I'm a mere college professor. So uh, Robert asked me to come and, and offer up some views on the state of our space program and what it is and what it ought to be, and I'm going to try to do that. I will do it blessedly without PowerPoint charts, as is my want, and uh, just from a few notes without reading a speech, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers if you're so inclined. Uh, I know that you need to end by two, and, and I do as well, and so we'll stay on point, or I hope so. So I think everybody is pretty familiar with the Obama administration's new plan for space. Um, but I'll just recap the highlights of it so that we have some talking points. Uh, key points from the, from the perspective of those who are human, interested in human exploration of space, whether to Mars or, or anywhere else, um, is that low Earth orbit, LEO, is to be set aside essentially as a commercial preserve. Uh, the United States under the Obama plan would, would make no plans um, to replace the space shuttle when it retires and the ability of the United States to put its own people or our partners' people in orbit in accordance with our space station agreements, the ability of the United States to put its own people in low Earth orbit um, would depend upon the development of commercial capability to do that. And until commercial capability is available, we would be relying upon uh, the Russian Soyuz system or possibly at a later time, although no agreements have been discussed, but possibly one could conceive also of uh, in engaging with, with China. Uh, but the next U.S. capability would be when and if a, a commercial supplier uh, raises its hand and can demonstrate some capability. Um, NASA would not immediately proceed to the development of a heavy lift 150 metric ton class vehicle as had been planned in the earlier administration, but instead would rethink the architecture of a heavy lift vehicle and would make a decision as to what heavy lifter to build uh, in 2015. I would ask you to note the timing. Um, the president um, uh, would, stand, would, would, would not be standing for election in 2016, and so by the time there was any budget year that would actually have to support the development of a real heavy lift rocket, uh, the president who is promising to do it would be gone. Um, I'm very, very, very good at making promises on other people's money, or as I sometimes put it, biting the bullet with other people's teeth. Uh, that's a skill almost anyone can acquire. Um, <laughs> We uh, would not return to the moon uh, under the Obama administration's plan. Uh, we would eschew the moon um, for uh, Mars someday. Loosely out there in the future, the goal for human exploration, as presidents have stated it for 35 or 40 years now, would be Mars sometime. Uh, we would visit an asteroid as the next destination, uh, an unspecified asteroid, uh, apparently without realizing that the delta V to get to almost all asteroids is higher than the delta V to get to Mars, and the flight times are comparably long in, in many cases, and the launch windows are uh, starkly fewer and narrower you have in many cases to reach the near-Earth asteroids, which I consider to be an interesting target, by the way, but, but not without understanding the facts that to reach many near-Earth asteroids requires more uh, total launch energy than going to Mars and certainly more than the Moon. And the launch windows in many cases can be measured in hours and they occur 
every decade or so. Uh, I'm, I'm being very loose with my numbers here to make a, a point. So in, in a number of different ways, reaching uh, asteroids can be harder than reaching Mars. So uh, question whether that's where you'd really want to start. Um, we're also, under the Obama plan, going to do game-changing technologies. Now, that's easy to do. Anytime I develop a new technology, I potentially change someone's game. Um, without a plan, I don't know what game. I don't know if it's the game I ought to be changing or if it's a high-value game or a low-value game, but I'm going to change something. So it's pretty easy to promise that I'll do game-changing technologies. It also needs to be understood, however, that the Office of Management and Budget loves it when people propose to do technology programs uh, because the goal of the Office and Management of Management and Budget remains always one thing, and that is to reduce domestic discretionary expenditures. And whenever technology programs are uh, in an executive agency's budget, whatever agency, not just NASA, any agency, um, the Congress surgically removes those programs and spreads the money to um, goals that, that uh, they have in mind. Because no congressman and no senator ever gets credit for a technology program, congressmen and senators get credit for projects, which are done and completed under their watch uh, in their state or districts, or by contractors in their state or districts, or where they have some interest, and where they can promise their constituents that they have done something useful. This is a feature of American democratic politics. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. It's not necessarily even bad. But uh, technology programs don't, in general, survive for more than a year or so. I've seen it over and over. So the sum and substance of the Obama administration's plan for human spaceflight, at least, uh, I can summarize it as we're not going anywhere and we're going to spend a lot of money doing it. <laughs> I, I mean, we're going to spend at least the, the $10 billion a year on human spaceflight that we're currently spending. Um, but we're not actually going to get much for it. I won't say we get nothing. Uh, that would be too extreme of a position, but we're not going to get a lot. Um, I've pointed out, actually, in a fairly, uh, what for me would pass for a learned paper, a fairly carefully researched paper that I wrote on the 50th anniversary of Sputnik and was published in Aviation Week's uh, online edition and pointed out with a very careful analysis of the budgetary figures that um, NASA, in fact, in its most recent 15 years of existence, received inf at more inflation-adjusted dollars than in the first 15 years of, of its existence during the Apollo era. And I've had a number of people agree with me that, that uh, the U.S. space program has not accomplished as much in its last 15 years as in its first 15 years, given more money. So if you liked that, you'll really like the next decade in which we do almost nothing and spend just as much. <laughs> now, uh, aside from issues of strategy, of, of global strategy, to which I will return in a moment, I have more concrete issues with the current plan. And of course, so do the House and the Senate. The Senate last night, the entire Senate ratified uh, its version of the authorization bill. A House bill was voted out of committee, and, and presumably the House will act on it, and then there will be a conference and a, and a compromise. And uh, either one, both of those bills are, are, in my view, radically better than the administration's plan. Um, not as good, in my view, as what we had, but radically better than the administration's plan. There are some concrete issues, however, the first and foremost of which to me is the idea that the United States as a government, as a society, as a nation, independent of what our commercial interests may or may not be, and to me the United States is about more than the interests of commercial parties, that there will not be, under the current plan, any U.S. government capability to put humans in space. Uh, I am not one. I, I, I am the strongest proponent of commercial space development that can be imagined. I am actually the administrator who first put money on it. Uh, we seem to have run across a dichotomy in very recent years that says if there is to be commercial space capability, there can't be government space capability. I, I 
personally believe that's patently foolish, and I'll return to that in a moment, but whether foolish or not, it is a feature of the new plan that there will not be U.S. government capability to put people in space. Now, as a matter of national strategic posture and purpose, uh, national position in the world, um, I consider this to be regrettable. Uh, I, I think our space program does uh, provide strategic, our civil space program does provide strategic value for the United States and our partners and allies as, a, as members of Western society. I think it's important that we continue to do that and abandoning our capability to do the most basic functional thing one can imagine in that context, putting your own people into space, to abandon that capability I think is strategically unwise. Leaving aside issues of global posture and strategy, uh, we have in fact, uh, as best I could tell after having folks do as careful an accounting as I could, we spent, and you hear all kinds of numbers turned around, but by the time the space station is fully and finally deployed, we will have spent about $55 billion in 05 dollars, and our partners will have spent about 20. Now, you'll hear all kinds of numbers tossed around, but that was the best number I could get. I don't certify that it's accurate because much of what went on in the 90s, frankly, we just simply could not trace. Um, that's a fact. Much of what was, went on in the 90s, we just really couldn't trace that accurately. But I think we spent, as a nation, about $55 billion on, this, on the station and about another 20 from our partners. So that's a $75 billion asset of the human race. It's not the space station that it could have been had it been designed without the constraint of the shuttle to lift it. Uh, it's not the space station that, that certainly many of us would have wanted, um, but we have it, and it is of more value in my view than not having it. And to build it and then not support it and not utilize it to the fullest possible extent of what we as human beings from 15 countries can get from it is foolish when the cost of so doing is, you know, two or three billion dollars a year after spending 75 and making it the centerpiece of our space policy uh, of ourselves and our partners for 25 years. But with the current policy, uh, our utilization of the space station is restricted to our capability to buy seats and cargo space for the foreseeable future from partners. Um, I consider that to be poor planning. I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say about it. It has nothing to do with global strategy. It has to do with, with sound technical and logistical and financial planning. Uh, other issues with reliance solely upon commercial capability exist. What if there is an accident? The cost of spaceflight is very high. The collateral damages from accidents, whether they carry cargo or people, even worse, are very high. We have seen this over and over again. I myself have participated in, in more failure reviews than I can count. I've led one or two. Uh, and of course, like the rest of you here, I've lived, I've, or many of the rest of you here, I've lived through three human spaceflight accidents as an adult and seen the collateral damage that results. It's not going to be substantially different because uh, a human spaceflight accident uh, is caused by a commercial party as opposed to a government enterprise. Um, the consequential damages could easily exceed the net worth of even a sizable company. So I have to ask from a capability point of view, if the United States government as a matter of policy relies upon a commercial provider to provide a human spaceflight service, delivery service, and there is an accident, um, how does the provider stay in business? How does the U.S. government continue to get its requirements met if the provider shrugs and says, you know, the damages are worth more than my company, I'm done? Many will say that the answer to that is, well, the government should indemnify the commercial provider. Well, I have a word or two on that in a moment. If there are commercial providers or, pro or, or provider or providers, we would be very fortunate to have more than one.